All right. Well, there's a lot we want to chat about today. And I'm a little hesitant to say this, but I do feel like reluctantly we need to have one more discussion about uh, a, a particular macronutrient that seems to get a lot of attention lately. And um, I, I don't necessarily want to talk about this because I think it's especially interesting um, or even uh, to which there's some new study that we need to shed light on. But it does seem to remain somewhat surrounded in some controversy, um, which I will refrain from publicly speculating on why said controversy exists, although privately I'm very happy to speculate on all the reasons for it. So with that said, let's talk about protein. Let's do it. I do think it's an important topic. You know, you and I have probably talked to all the world's experts on protein. And, you know, we were chatting a moment ago about this recommended daily allowance for protein, the so-called RDA. And really what it should be called is the minimal daily allowance in all, I would say. It, it recommended almost sounds like optimal in a way. Yeah. Like I think people confuse that with the optimal amount of protein, right? So it's kind of tricky. Um, and I think that's an important place to start because of that reason where this amount, which is 0 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight per day, is the RDA for protein, right? And I know that you've probably had countless experts on talking about this. I've had experts on talking about this, Stu Phillips being one. There's so many different publications that, I mean, people can start off by reading one of them here uh, by Stu Phillips. Perspective, protein requirements and optimal intakes in aging. Are we ready to recommend more than the recommended daily allowance? And there's several of these out there. Okay, I'm just, this is just one. And essentially, if you, if you have the time and the willingness to go into the scientific literature and actually read something for yourself or listen to The Drive or listen to my podcast and the actual experts talking about it, what you will hear or what you will learn is that a lot of the studies that were done to determine this RDA were flawed. Um, they were called nitrogen balance studies. And for many reasons, they're flawed. I can't, I don't want to get into all the technical reasons, but for one, you know, what they are doing is measuring the amount of nitrogen that is excreted in urine after you are metabolizing protein, right? And some of the flaws that are, I would say, the most important here are that different types of foods that have protein in them have different nitrogen to protein ratios. They're collecting urine in which, the, you know, the, the case is, is that it's an incomplete collection. I mean, like when you pee in one of those cups, like you don't get all the urine. It's incomplete con co uh, collection. And so essentially what's happened... And, and we lose nitrogen through other means. Exactly. That is not Sweat, just urine. Yes, exactly. We lose the nitrogen through other means. And so essentially the signal to noise ratio is pretty low. And ultimately what like countless experts have now agreed upon is that the protein for the RDA has been underestimated because of those reasons. And there have been new studies that have been done. These have been like more stable isotope studies. The major isotope that's used is the L13 carbon labeling phenylalanine, in which case these studies take a small cohort of people, give them a known amount of protein with that isotope tracer, and then that um, tracer is oxidized when it's you know metabolized, and that's measured through breath, the oxidation of phenylalanine, right? And so now you're getting a quantification that's much more accurate in terms of your protein, you know, steady state and turnover, right? And so the whole point here is that you're trying to figure out the minimal amount of protein you need to take in every day to make sure that you're not in a negative protein balance. Why is that important? Well, that's important because we don't store amino acids, right? We don't store amino acids like we store fatty acids as triglycerides or we store glucose as glycogen, right? The major source of our amino acid storage tank, so to speak, is our muscle, skeletal muscle tissue. And you don't want to be pulling from that skeletal muscle tissue to get amino acids every day. Why do we need amino acids every day? Because everything in our body requires proteins. Proteins are doing all the work in our body and proteins are made up of amino acids. And so we have to be giving ourselves an intake, um, daily intake of amino acids to make sure we able, we're able to do all those functions, right? I just want to state that again, because I, I do think there's a very important and fundamental um, point here that, that 
is is glossed over when we talk about it because we take it for granted. Like if we studied biochemistry and anybody who's you know studied biochemistry will know this, but we can store fat in unlimited quantities, right? So if you deprive a person of fat calories for a period of time, they have a long reservoir that they can dig into. Not indefinitely, but they can. We can store carbohydrates. Now, we can't store them quite as much because you know we only have so much glycogen we can store in the muscle and in the liver. But when we break down fat, we keep making the substrate to actually make glucose, so we get into a nice little rhythm. But to your point, the only place that an amino acid sits in residence in our body is in the muscle. Therefore, if we even get near the edge where we are not getting sufficient intake of amino acids, we don't have a buffer. We don't have a rainy day fund that we can dip into. We immediately start to catabolize or break down muscle. Now, I don't think we have to make the case that that's a bad idea, but for the sake of completeness, we should state there is not really a single scenario I can think of that is clinically relevant where it would be desirable to give up muscle mass. You know, maybe if you're Mr. Olympia, you can sacrifice muscle mass. But for you and me, and I think everybody listening to us, giving up muscle mass because we are falling short on our protein intake would be a strategic error and an unforced error. Exactly. I mean, for short-term and long-term health. So, I mean, I think that's pretty clear. And and that's where, you know, it come, this, this RDA not being enough is a very important point because if we look at the actual, so let me go back to this isotracer, isotope tracer studies, those multiple studies, okay, multiple studies, as you know, have shown that the minimal- And we'll link to these in the show notes, by the way, just so that people can go and actually look at the papers yes. as opposed to reading about it on right. social media. Sounds good. Um, multiple of these papers have shown that, you know, really going up to more like 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight per day is what is needed to prevent people, us, adults, from being in this negative protein balance. That's quite a bit more than the 0 0.8 grams per kilogram. 50% more. Right. It's 50% more. So like most of the studies done, isotope, isotope tracer studies are between 30 to 50% more. So... And that's really important because um, if we look at the actual protein intakes of adults, you know, these are nutritional surveys that are done. Of course, they're all flawed. We can talk about it. I mean, we all know the, the, the flaws of questionnaires. And, but let's just talk about like what we think people are actually taking in. Adults are mostly taking in, all adults are taking in about 0 0.9 grams per kilogram body weight per day of protein. So pretty close to what that RDA is, not what it should be, right? Older adults, um, if we look at the gender, male versus female, males are taking in about 0 0.9 grams per kilogram body weight. Females are taking in 0.8. So they're, they're really just hitting that, what we call RDA, which now we have established is not enough. The RDA is not enough to, not, to basically be in a, a, a net protein balance. So that's really important. And that's essentially telling us that most adults are walking around without being in a good, you know, in steady state protein balance, right? So they're so, in so here's an interesting question, Rhonda. So we know the rates at which muscle mass, skeletal mass, um, are declining by decade in an aging population. Um, is there any way we can estimate, I'm guessing the answer is no, but on the off chance you would know, is there any way we can estimate what percent of that decay is simply being driven by uh, insufficient amino acid consumption versus other factors, right? Other factors would be anabolic resistance associated with aging. Other factors would be anabolic resistance associated with sedentary behavior. Other factors would be lack of sufficient resistance training. Like there are many factors that explain clearly the fact that as a person goes from 50 to 60 to 70, on average, they're losing muscle mass. But it would be interesting to consider how much of that is explained by the fact that they are also barely skirting the minimum amount of nitrogen that they need, and in many cases, falling below it. Right. I, so to answer your question, I don't know that there's a direct way to do that, but I do know that there are studies that have shown that when older adults, so older adults like, that are really more susceptible, susceptible to the things that you were saying, like anabolic resistance, um, where people are basic, where your muscle tissue is not as sensitive to amino acids because of, mostly because of phys physical inactivity, which increases with age. Um, but when older adults take in 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight per day of protein, it 
it nearly eliminates um, some of the age-related muscle loss that happens. So I think that is some evidence to sort of support what you were saying in that if you just increase your protein intake to by what 50%. this minimum, yeah, yeah, by 50% to this minimum, what the RDA should be, 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight per day. I think that's pretty much what most all the experts agree is that like it's time to change that RDA to that number, right? The minimal amount that you need per day. If we just do, if older adults just do that, they're they're actually preventing a lot of the age related loss in muscle that occurs. And we also know that um, older women, if they take in that amount of 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight per day, they're 30 percent less likely to have frailty in old age, which is also very important, right? So I think that's pretty good evidence that it's clear that just increasing your protein intake by 50 percent is really important for aging, right? For our muscle, for our muscle health, and also is getting us out of that net negative state that we're in. So, I mean, I so, know we're going to. So, step one is we should move the floor from 0.8 to 1.2. Yes. I think the floor being the minimal amount of protein that we need to take in per day. This is not optimal. We're going to get into optimal, right? This is just like the new RDA, 